This is Thought in Motion, a series dedicated to the seminars of psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. Today's video covers lectures 12 and 13 and seminar 3. The purpose of these lectures is to establish the central role of the primordial signifier in psychosis by first showing its pivotal function in neurosis. Lacan focuses on cases of hysteria in particular because of the predominance of fantasies relating to pregnancy and procreation that superficially seem comparable to the delusions of Schreber. Now, admittedly, these lectures, especially the parts on sexuation and sexual difference, were challenging to work through without reference to some of the ideas Lacan later develops. For example, the formulas of sexuation in Seminar 20 are the more mature of Lacan's thoughts on the topic. And we don't get a well-developed articulation of what the phallus is here, as we do, say, in later parts of this seminar, as well as in Seminar 4. So permit me to struggle through these ideas that we'll return to again in the series. Of course, comments and corrections, when done in the spirit of aiding our collective understanding, are always welcomed. For those who may not have watched it yet, my video covering Seminar 2, Lectures 20 to 21 represents one of the first attempts to discuss the clinical structures associated with neurosis in some detail. In that video, it is mentioned that repression produces the lost object that becomes the cause of desire. Hysteria and neurosis are distinguished by their respective strategies to overcome this separation, with obsessionals refusing to recognize the object's connection to the big other and denying their own lack. In contrast, hysterics identify with the lost object becoming what the big other does lack. In this video, I'll address the following questions. One, how does sexuation take place through the Oedipus complex? Two, how does Lacan conceptualize sexual difference? And three, how does the fundamental question function in the expression of symptoms in hysteria? As we come to the end of Lecture 12 and enter Lecture 13, we're presented with one of Lacan's most explicit developments to this point in the seminars of the Oedipus complex and the asymmetry of sexuation among women and men. One of the main points Lacan raises is that the realization of the woman's sex, as accomplished through the drama of the Oedipus complex, takes on an extra detour that entails a set of advantages and disadvantages relative to the sexuation of men. This all requires a good deal of unpacking to properly understand it. First, sexuation does not mean sexuality, but rather refers to the process of acquiring a masculine or feminine position on the level of the symbolic. Lacan does not use the word gender, though that word is perhaps closer to what Lacan refers to in speaking about sexuation and sexual difference than what the English word sex means to us, which generally pertains to anatomical and chromosomal characteristics and is often distinguished from gender. Nonetheless, I'm not entirely sure that a neat distinction can be made in Lacan either. Lacan affirms a notion of sexual difference not based strictly in biology. However, sexual difference does not seem to be equivalent to a purely socialized conception that takes no account of the real sexual organs either. An important starting point for approaching this topic is recognizing that without a thorough appreciation of the difference between the imaginary and the symbolic, very little progress can be made in our understanding of what Lacan is proclaiming here. On a side note, we also need to take into account the real, but very little is said of this in these specific lectures. The integration of sexuality is tied to recognition by the big other. The law prohibits the subject from realizing its sexuality except via the symbolic. This is the meaning of the Oedipus complex according to Lacan. As Lacan states here, the Oedipus complex is a dialectic between imaginary and symbolic. How is this the case? Let's first revisit what each term in this dialectic entails. The symbolic is the entire world system based in words and constitutes the limits of knowledge of things. Lacan goes so far as to suggest that the limit of the number of things we know and can think about are limited to the words we have. The symbolic is also a domain of neutrality. By this, I believe Lacan means that it's like a machine. 
an automaton that operates independently of libidinal investments. The imaginary, in contrast, is first the domain of ethology and animal psychology. Sexual relations are established through imaginary capture, thereby making possible the eroticization of the object. The two registers, imaginary and symbolic, come together in the Oedipus complex to give rise to one's sexual position. It entails an uprooting of the imaginary and resituating it in the symbolic, facilitating a desire for and identification with an object that is isolated and neutralized, but then eroticized. This process allows for more eroticized objects in human experience than in the animal, thereby giving rise to the polymorphous perversity of human sexuality. Essential to the Oedipus complex is the function of the phallus. The phallus in its imaginary function is an object that moves between mother and child. The mother desires this object and the child seeks to become it through identification, thereby becoming what the mother desires. The symbolic father is a fourth term in this equation and enters here, rendering it impossible for the child to identify with that imaginary phallus, presenting the child with a fundamental choice of either accepting castration, which Lacan means here alienation, or rejecting castration. Lacan seems to view the subject as always desiring the mother, regardless of whether the subject is male or female. And for both, the father represents the term that intervenes between mother and child and serves within the imaginary as a kind of rival. However, despite those similarities, having access to the symbolic order does require confronting the notion of sexual difference. Though both men and women desire the mother and assume castration, the process of sexualization through identification is different for each. The difference lends each to tend toward a particular constellation of neurotic symptoms. Although both must identify with the imaginary phallus, the symbolization of woman entails a situation in which the imaginary furnishes an absence for what Lacan calls here the phallic gestalt. Consequently, the woman is forced into a detour in her sexuation by taking the image of the other sex as the basis of identification, making her position more complicated and unassimilable. In contrast, there's a much more straightforward identification with the same-sex parent for the man. There's a lot here to unpack, and unfortunately, we're not given a good deal to work with within the constraints of these lectures to make sense of many of these statements. It's perhaps easier to say what Lacan is not saying rather than what he is saying. First, sexuation is not a purely natural process based in anatomical differences, but involves these differences as they intersect with the symbolic. Consequently, such an outcome of sexuation is not a necessary nor universal unfolding, but a structural outcome within a particular constellation of the symbolic order. It's normative only in the sense that the symbolic imposes norms upon us. Or to put it another way, one could imagine another kind of symbolic structuration of sexual positions, but it would likely entail a non-patriarchal law governing the symbolic. However, I'm not even sure that that accurately represents what Lacan thinks. What confuses the matter is how Lacan speaks of the process of sexuation here without much reference to a relativity of the symbolic. Of course, the symbolic as symbolic intrinsically implies a social and cultural dimension, but Lacan does not even suggest here the possibility of an alternative organization. Perhaps either he could not envision a symbolic that does not situate the phallus in a privileged position, or he was single-mindedly focused on the only symbolic his audience would be situated within. Lacan does acknowledge, however, that the impossibility of ever fully symbolizing the function of man Man and woman renders one's sexual position impossible for a subject to establish once and for all, thereby rendering the establishment of one's sexual position fundamentally precarious and a source of incessant self-questioning. The lack of clarity does not seem to be purely a product of my own failing to penetrate into what Lacan is saying, though I admit that's certainly playing a role here. 
since the secondary literature is replete with divergences on this issue, with someone like Judith Butler who accuses Lacan's account of upholding heteronormative values, and Luce Irrigere who accuses Lacan of promoting a form of phallocentrism. On the other hand, there are thinkers such as Elenka Zupancic and Mari Rudy who seems to hold a more favorable view of Lacan's theorizing on this topic. Finally, and adding to the complications here, Lacan's theorizing on this matter is argued to have evolved over his career, with his later works emphasizing the failure of the function of the phallus and a notion of feminine jouissance that goes beyond the phallus. Some of these developments may have been in response to feminist criticisms he encountered in his own lifetime. Now let's take up some of the implications of this for neurosis. The structure of neurosis is to use the ego to ask questions. What does this mean? Lacan indicates that the subject's singular existence around procreation and death is radically unassimilable to the signifier. Why can't the symbolic account for this? First, Lacan indicates that the symbolic only accounts for the succession of beings and not how one being creates another. Second is because the signifier treats the subject as already dead or immortal. I believe this is because the signifier marks an absence of the signified and refers to only other signifiers in a chain without end. So for example, an algorithm is indifferent to life and death. It simply runs its operations in sequential order. The name of the subject is itself not tied to the life of the subject as it may function prior to birth and persist well after death. If the symbolic only pertains to existence, then that which fundamentally resides at or outside the boundaries of being can never be fully considered. As such, we always remain a question to ourselves. In neurosis, there is an interweaving of imaginary and symbolic in relation to the question. The question of birth and death do not remain inert, but instead take on an imaginary character through the ego that, according to Lacan, indicates reality for the subject, though reality as an illusion. The ego raises the question that the symbolic cannot fully symbolize, giving rise to its rearticulation in neurotic symptoms. This is because in raising the question, the ego seeks not to raise it. It's a question that belongs to the unconscious discourse, and so when the ego raises it, it is always in the form of a misrecognized question. Consequently, the question finds another meaning to reformulate itself, that being the particular configuration of symptoms. Lacan provides us with a more specific understanding of this through hysteria. Lectures 12 and 13 present two cases of this clinical structure, one an example of a masculine hysteria regarding a 33-year-old man who after an accident inexplicably got worse, and the other is Freud's famous case of Dora. As examples of hysteria, both cases are marked by a fundamental question, which Lacan identifies as, am I a man or a woman? In the case of the male subject, it's more specifically formulated by the question, am I or am I not someone capable of procreating? In the case of Dora, the question is presented as, what is a feminine organ? Both cases are joined together in wondering what it's like to be a woman. The reformulation and insistence of the question gives rise to symptoms. Let's consider the case of Dora to make some more sense of this. In being confronted by the question, what is a woman, the subject attempts to symbolize the female organ, presenting itself as an imaginary anatomy. However, because the attempt at symbolization is unsuccessful, which was inevitable since complete symbolization is impossible, the subject attempts another strategy by identifying with the man whose imaginary phallus is the instrument through which she attempts to apprehend the female organ. This identification in turn allows for a kind of stabilization of the hysteric sexual position, the one that takes what is a complicated matter and simplifies it, makes it more manageable in a sense. Thus, in hysteria, we can see how rather than uprooting the imaginary relationship to the phallus through a progressive act of symbolization, as is the normal process of sexualization, the hysteric instead raises the question through her ego and thus addresses it in an act of imaginary identification. The effect of doing so is a reformulation of the question at the level of the symptom, which principally manifests through aphonia in Dora, the loss of her voice. 
symptoms become organized whenever there's a triggering of the neurosis, being a reformulation or insistence of the question. So unlike psychosis, the hysteric raises a question that is first aroused at the symbolic level rather than merging and remaining purely within the imaginary level, even as that question is then resituated at the level of the imaginary for the neurotic subject. We've not even begun to scratch the surface of what Lacan has to say on this topic, so let's not consider this a comprehensive or final word, but a prelude of more to come. Let's also keep in mind why Lacan is giving this analysis here, which is not to develop a robust articulation of sexuation or hysteria, but to set up a foil against which we may better appreciate the clinical structure of psychosis. I want to thank the following for supporting this channel on Patreon. If you wish to support this work on Patreon, the link is below in the description. You can also support this work by liking and sharing this video and subscribing to my channel. As always, thank you for watching, and until next time, be well.